You know, I've heard about this thing that feels like an upward acceleration to which there is no end. I think it's called the exponential curve. Mm. Did you know? Yeah. Could you explain maybe perhaps one of the things that we're currently experiencing and how to go about living through it and with it? Right. So I would like to add that it's not something that we're experiencing only. It's something that we're all experiencing in damn near every aspect of life. Whether you're trying to build a business, learn how to play an instrument, learn how to ride a bike. It is normally an exponential curve of learning and of growth. Because as you may know, if you go back to when you're a kid and they give you a recorder, and I'm not talking about a electronic recording device. I'm talking about the fucking flute thing that they give you when you're a kid, <laughs> the recorder. Damn near all of us have learned how to play a recorder. When you're learning how to play the recorder, you probably are not that great initially. It sounds like a whole bunch of crap coming out of that instrument. But over time, you slowly start to get better, slowly, slowly, slowly. Then before you know it, you're taking off. You're learning how to play hot cross buns without even having to think about it, bro. And it's on key. On key. You get an A on your, your recorder test in school for your music class. Because at first, it was something that you felt like you would never understand how to play. You would never get it down. But as time progressed, slowly but surely, you started to get better. And then you started to get better. And you started to get better times two, times three, times four. It kept increasing to the point to where you took off like a rocket. And that goes with damn near anything that you're trying to do in life. It's always going to start off real rocky at the beginning. And for an extended period of time, for what you may not know, you're probably going to suck <laughs> at whatever it is that you're doing for a while. But then you're going to learn some things along the road of suckdom. <laughs> you're going to learn some things where it's like, man, I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I did this right. I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I did this right. I did this right. I did this right. I did this wrong. I did it so on and so forth to the point to where you stack those rights, you stack those wins. Then it goes like this, like this. Uh, oh, a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. Bam. So what we would like to talk to you all about on this podcast today is that exponential curve and how to not only get to the top here, because that's where everyone wants to be. Everyone wants to be at the top. But the real thing that we're going to focus on is how to get through this part. Because there's going to be a part where you're not seeing any growth. Zero. But eventually, you start to trend up. So, Jose. Yes, sir. When we're talking about the exponential curve here, uh -huh. could you please enlighten our viewers about the compounding effect? I feel like that would be very effective for our viewers to learn about. Very cheeky. Yeah. So for the compound effect, I actually want to preface this with a quote from James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits. Yes, sir. Shout out to James Clear. And this is about the topic of small decisions that make you slightly better on a daily basis. It is easy to dismiss the value of making slightly better decisions on a daily basis. Sticking with the fundamentals is not impressive. Falling in love with boredom is not sexy. Getting 1% better isn't going to make headlines. There is one thing about it though. It works. So we're going to talk about the 1% better every day rule on this tangent, which is essentially if you get 1% better every single day, which is 1.01 to the power of 365 for 365 days in a year, not accounting for leap years, by the end of the year, you've increased 
by 37.78%. So let's round up. You've gotten 38% better at whatever it is that you've been doing by getting 1% better on, on a daily basis versus if you get 1% worse by the end of the year, which is not 0.99 to the power of 365, it equals to 0.03% progress, which is essentially zero. So all this to say, if you get 1% better each day for one year, you'll end up 37 times better by the time you're done. And this is why small choices don't make much of a difference at the time that you make them, but they add up over a long term, which is why that's why we call this the compounding effect. Over time, everything builds and you actually get to see the fruits of your labor, not in the moment, but in the end. And you know who knows that specific compounding effect? Who? The greats. The greats. So if you look at someone like Serena Williams, right? The probably the best tennis player of all time. Tony Robbins mentored her and a multitude of other great athletes that have all accomplished things that most people couldn't even dream of. And you would think, hey, these people are already great. It's not like he mentored them when they were starting out. He mentored them when they were at the, the, the top, per se. And you would think, why would someone like Serena Williams, why would someone like Kobe, why would someone like, insert a great person that you may know here, would want to get better why would they seek him out to get better? They're already at the top. And he said that they knew something that most people take for granted, which is what you said. Even if it's by 1%, 5%, 10%, to most people, it's not a big deal. If you get a 10% on a test, you failed horrendously. However, even if it's by 10%, if you change their mindset by 10%. You change their technique by 10%. So slightly. It could tremendously affect their end results. So that's why Tony Robbins was able to make a, a lot of money by saying, hey, look, we can tweak this thing here even just a little bit. And these greats were willing to say, hey, look, I'll pay you to do this make me 5% better, make me 10% better. Because even though I'm already at the kind of top of my game, if I increase by that much through the compounding effect, it should have a tremendous effect. So this is not something that, again, we are experiencing. We only think that this can apply to us or whatnot. Look at the people that you look up to that are the greatest at what they do, they utilize this as well. So I wanted to point that out there. And that makes me think of a quote from Jim Rohn, mm. which, which I know you've heard. Everybody's heard Jim Rohn speak. He's mm. an old fashioned motivational speaker. Long gone, long gone. But Jim Rohn says, success is a few simple disciplines practiced every day, while failure is simply a few errors in judgment repeated every day which makes me think of the British cycling team. I don't know if you've heard this story about the, the coach who completely changed the British riders' lifestyles, which led to their complete dominance in the sport of cycling for a short period of time. No, I haven't. Enlighten me, please. I'll do my best to, to get my gears on here. So his name is Dave Brailsford. He was the new performance director of the professional cycling team for Great Britain. And essentially, he came up with this idea known as the aggregation of marginal gains. And it stemmed from everything from split testing, the pillows that the athletes sleep on, the muscle rubs, the temperatures of their rooms, every component within how they're shipping the bikes. So I remember they painted the inside of the actual trailer white so that they could see all the specks of dust so they would get less dust on the cycle on the on the bicycles when they were transporting them 
all these minor components, right? The different electrolyte combinations, the different training regimens. And essentially what he was doing is through that aggregation of marginal gains, he was increasing the potential that every single athlete had to perform. And so in his summary, he says the whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike and then improve it by 1%, you will get a significant increase when you put all of them together. And so he went on to take the British cycling team to dominate the roads and the tracks in the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, where they won an astounding 60% of the gold medals available. And if I'm not mistaken, it had been roughly 10 years since they had won a single gold medal. So he took the team from the worst to 60% of the best, and then eventually the best, just through the aggregation of marginal gains, that little 1%, where everybody says, ah, the water I drink is okay, or oh, my sleep is decent, or oh, the electrolytes that I get are sufficient, or the way I transport my bikes is fine. But no, every single component matters when it plays into the aggregate. How does, how do your systems work? And are your systems truly optimized on every single corner? Can you see every elephant in the room? Are you able to address every problem as soon as it comes up? Or can you prevent the problems? Because you would much rather prevent problems than having, than trying to put out fires every single day. And that's why only you can prevent forest forest fires. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You're good. You're good. Okay. I learned from the best. Hey, you know what I'm saying? So now that you say that, I think that it's interesting to, not interesting, but important to give examples from our own lives Mm -hmm. that, you know, Mm -hmm. people could relate to. So for some of the real life examples that we have here and experienced um, by... Um, increasing by small percentages here. Um, If you haven't noticed, if you've been an avid watcher of us since the initial conception of the podcast, you would realize a lot of changes, small changes, but changes nonetheless. Where we podcast is different. The couch we're podcasting on is different. We added pillows to that couch at a certain point in time. We added different lighting, turning certain lights on, turning certain lights off, adding additional lighting that's bright as fuck to our right (laughs) or to your left, adding small things like this candle here. The mics. The mics. We used to not have mics. Computers. Multiple angles. Sound here. Yeah. Small things, multiple camera angles, what have you. These small little changes, maybe not even consciously, could be part of the reason why you continue to watch us or why you like watching us. You're like, oh, there's something about them. The ambience of their podcast is just so soothing or the quality of their voice, the sounds of their voice is just so soothing. I just, something about it. Or maybe on the medium form content, you just like the the audio that's being played. Right. In the backdrop. Little things. Small things that might only increase our success or increase our viewership by a couple percentages. However, those small little percentages, those small little touches that we add to the podcast are what will initially help us get to that point of growth where we go from this to this. So... Even if it's something small, <laughs> even if it's something small, hold on. One, I, actually, 1K in two hours and 22 minutes and two subscribers. Speaking of small improvements from the short that we just posted two and a half hours ago. Which, if you haven't noticed, we increased the, well, not necessarily increased, but we improved the thumbnail of the shorts we improved how we caption certain things we improved how we clip up certain things in those shorts these little small little details 
as we're talking, literally produced us two more subscribers than what we had before the podcast started. So if you don't think that what we're saying is real or accurate, it literally just happened. This was not planned. It literally just happened because the small little incremental changes that we make has propelled us to higher and higher heights. And we've talked about a lot of good, what can come from that. But I feel like we haven't touched on really the difficult part of this exponential curve. Mm. And we know how difficult it can be because in most things, when you're trying to start something from scratch, you're not going to see returns relatively soon. So, Jose. Yes, sir. How exactly are you able to continue striving through this phase of what it seems like no improvement, even though there is improvement, you just can't realize it. How do you get through times like that? Because I feel like a lot of people are struggling in that time where they're trying to do something new. They're trying to build something from scratch and they're just like, man, I feel like I'm not getting anywhere. Right. I'm going to have to refer to good old Bedros Koulian for this one. Mm. It's been a while since I've said that name, but he always lives in the heart. So Bedros Koulian has this concept called aggressive patience. And if you know anything about me, I'm a very type A aggressive person when it comes to anything and everything. Really? <laughs> yes. So I take things head on. I always want to be the tip of the spear, not just spearheading things, but be at the, at the front, taking all of the pain and all the brunt of the work. And so for me, patience has always been something that I've struggled with. So applying aggression to patience, although it's an oxymoron, is actually one of the most successful ways that I found success with moving forward when it comes to small incremental progression on a day to day basis, the compounding effect, the way it really helps you is to, well, the way that, uh, being aggressively patient helps you when it comes to shouldering the beginning of the exponential curve is by buckling down and hunkering down and making the goal, the task itself, mm. the action not the end goal, but the action. If your action is to stare at that fucking cookie sitting on the counter and say, not today, sugar does not win. Then that's the goal. That's all you have to think about. You don't have to think about the thousand calories that you just saved yourself. And then by the end of the week, 7,000 calories that you're down. And then by the end of the month, what, 28,000 calories that you're down. You don't have to think about that. You don't have to think about the way your six pack is going to pop in three months. No, you just have to think about, Hey, I'm not eating that fucking cookie today and that's all that matters. And you're applying that patience to that single thought, that single action, that single moment to where you're not even focused on the goal. You've actually almost forgotten about the goal because the goal being so daunting is what makes it very attractive to make large steps towards your large goals. So I found the best way is to break that goal down, look at the smallest components and focus on the action rather than the goal. And what's interesting about that, you ever... <laughs> say that you were in class at a, a, a point in time and you're like, man, I have something to do after this. And you keep looking at the clock. And if you look at the clock, it feels like time moves by so much slower. It's like, what the heck? I need to get out of here, but time just seems so much slower. This is, oh, this is the last class of the day too. Once I, I get through this, I'm finished. All that. But it just draws out that 30 minutes, that hour, that hour and 30 minutes feels so much longer because you're focusing on it. So when it comes to this exponential curve in life, in whatever it is that you're doing, if you're focusing on the end the whole time, it's going to be like, wow, I've been at this for so long. It's ridiculous. I don't know if I'm any closer to my goal of getting that Pagani. This is ridiculous. I, you know what? I might just give up. And matter of fact, right now, the Pagani doesn't even seem, it seems less realistic than it did before. Exactly. Because the slump that I'm in. So 
when you're thinking about the end goal the whole time, it just exacerbates that the length of the exponential curve. You feel every single second of that shit to the point to where it's like, man, I can't. I This is excruciating. I can't do this shit. I can't. I can't tolerate this anymore. But like Jose said, if you focus on the action, you focus on the little things, you focus on keeping your head down. When you look up, when you come up for air, you'll be at a completely different place than what you thought you were on that along that exponential curve because you're not focusing on the end. You're not focusing on the end of the work. You're not focusing on the end where you get millions of dollars. You're not focusing on the end where you have 15 different homes. You're focusing on the step-by-step process. And I feel like that's what helped us and what continues to help us through things nowadays is that we don't focus on the end goal every day per se. We focus on making sure all the little things are taken care of. And then when a year is over, you realize, oh, shit, we did what we said that we were going to do in a year. We did it in six months. Mm-hmm. We did what we said that we were going to do in two years in a year. So thinking of it from that perspective is a lot more fruitful, in my opinion, because to me, it almost speeds up time and helps you travel that exponential curve even quicker because you're not focused on the top. You're focused on right here, getting through it day by day. But go ahead. Well, I was wondering, have you ever had a moment where there's a task that you really don't want to do? Oh, of course. And you sit there and you finally muster up the courage, the conviction, the energy, what have you to complete that task or just to get the task started. Yeah. And as we always say, and as we always experience, the first step is always the hardest step. Zero zero to one is more difficult than one to 100. And once you come over that barrier, I'm pretty sure you've experienced where you get completely immersed in the task. Correct. And then when you're triumphant, you look back and you go, I don't even have too much of a recollection of what happened. (laughs) Yeah. I for sure know that. Shit. I don't even remember the pain. I don't even remember the time that it took. I don't even remember the suffering. I don't even know what I was thinking. I don't know. Matter of fact, I don't know how I got here to the end. Literally. Could you walk me through what you think that is? Because I almost don't know what it is. I don't know exactly what it may be scientifically. However, what I would like to call it is the zone. Enter the zone. Enter the zone. And I love that you said that because we are experiencing that right now. And I've, I, and I've experienced it multi- multitudes of times before. But when it, See, there's so many words that we don't even know which one to use. Multitude, yeah, I know, yeah. multiple, multiplicities. Yeah, it just... <laughs> walking encyclopedia it's it's you know mr dictionary here yeah you know mr thesaurus yeah that's what we do so when we're thinking about the zone it's something that once you're in it i feel like you know because the things that were so difficult for you to do before not saying they got any easier, but the barrier to entry is a lot smaller. So that task that would normally take you 15 minutes for you to be able to complete or be able to start even because you're like, man, I don't even want to do this. It goes from 15 minutes to about 30 seconds or some shit like that. And I'm not trying to, you know, say that it's going to take that time for you, but it definitely shortens because you can think of it this way. If you're waking up in the morning, right? Everybody has that time period in the morning where there's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to get up. Uh, Some people hit snooze, all that stuff. But when you're in the zone and you know that you have something to do, you know that you have things that you need to get done in the day, you know that you have a bigger goal that you're trying to accomplish, you're in the zone. You don't say, hey, look, I'm going to snooze for, no, it's okay. (sighs) All right, time to go. 
That's all you get. And it's funny that you said that too, because for me, I feel like I'm in the zone. When I, I feel like it's, I am in the zone right now. And shit like naps, even me trying to take a nap. I'm so in the zone that my body is accustomed or growing accustomed to how I'm moving to the point to where a nap that would normally take people like an hour or two hours, that's that qualifies as a nap. My body is like, okay, you get 10 minutes. Done. That's it. Yeah. 10 minutes. You wake up. All right. That's it. Okay. Time to keep going and doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So when you're in the zone, you're locked dead on to whatever it is that you're set on doing. And it's going to take a lot for you to come out of that zone to the point to where little grievances, little things that pop up on you during the day don't affect you as much as they did anymore. Why? Because again, you're deadlocked on the goal. And as you are in the zone, it helps you matriculate through that exponential curve just phenomenally. And I feel like it's definitely helped us a lot, especially during that initial beginning phase. And this is not something more often than not that you get right at the beginning, but somewhere along that little phase here where you're still kind of stagnant, you're going to get used to doing the same things, dealing with the same bullshit day in and day out to the point to where you don't even think about it anymore. You're swimming, you're trudging through the mud, then you get in the zone. And once you get in the zone, it's almost like you're unstoppable. And again, you'll know when you're in the zone because to me, it's not easy, again, to deal with any of this stuff. It gets better, not easier. Correct. But it's a, it's a euphoric feeling of achievement, strength, and pressure even that you have that allows you to keep going. And for me, Jose, again, I call that the zone. So I don't know what you would call it for you, but. Well, you are correct in your vernacular. Scientifically, it is the flow state. Ah, but I think we will actually leave that as a podcast topic for another day. Ah, yeah. Because I think that if you can go on a monologue that long, I think we can make it into its own episode because I think everybody wants to know how to enter the zone, otherwise known as the flow state, in order to just get the most out of life, business, and the pursuit of excellence. Right. So with that, my friends, I leave you all with this. Make sure that you ride the exponential curve. But know that it starts with one step at a time that compounds into millions. The Amco Podcast. Signing out. Mike, mic check. The AM Club Podcast.